Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 8A. This is the first of two tutorials focused on accounting for convertible bonds. This tutorial will focus on accounting for convertible bonds using the residual and zero equity approaches. This tutorial has four major learning objectives. The first will be to review accounting for convertible bonds using the residual method under both IFRS and ASPE. Second will be to review accounting for convertible bonds using the zero equity method, which is applicable to ASPE only. Third, to prepare journal entries from the perspective of the bond issuer. And finally, to review present value concepts. This tutorial uses the Madison Corp A example, so please make sure you download the correct file and preview the information before proceeding. We will start with requirement one, which is basically to prepare all the required journal entries to account for the transactions under the residual method. And we're going to have to record the issue of the bonds on January 2nd, 2020. We're going to record the early conversion of the bonds on June 30th, 2022. And the final conversion of the bonds on December 31st, 2024. The first thing we're going to do is calculate the present value of the bond and show you what the bond amortization table looks like. Now the first thing we're going to do is calculate the present value of the bonds without the conversion feature. We're going to have to account for this showing what it looks like without the conversion feature and then what the bonds would be with the conversion feature and we'll see how that comes into play. What we have then is basically an amortization table that shows the present value being 458,417 calculated as 10N because it's a 10 year bond, 3.5 IY, so 7% divided by 2, a payment of $12,500 calculated as $500,000 times 5% divided by 2 for 2 payments, and a 500,000 future value. A couple other things to note here, you notice I have in red this uh, line at payment 5 or year 5. This reflects the early conversion that we're going to have to deal with and you should be able to prove the value at the point of the early conversion based on just changing the number of periods in your calculator. Because there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 periods left, you change this to 5N and you'll end up with 477,425. And then finally, at maturity, of course, the value of the bonds should be $500,000 in a completed amortization table. What we'll do next is show a bond amortization table based on the market value or present value with the conversion feature at 102. What happened in this problem is we are told that the bonds sold at 102. If we take 500,000 times 1.02, that's how we get $510,000 in bonds. And that's because those bonds are sold with a conversion feature. If the bonds did not have a conversion feature, they would have sold for the present value that was shown on the previous slide. Because they do have a conversion feature, it makes the bonds a little bit more attractive, more valuable. We now have a present value of 510,000. The problem is, in order to complete the amortization table, we need to know what the interest rate is. Well, we actually don't know what the interest rate is right up front because we are told that the bonds are sold at 102. Now, just because they're sold at 102, be careful, does not mean that the uh, implicit interest rate is 2%. What we have to do is in this little piece right down here. We have to calculate the effective rate. To do that, we have to basically use your calculator and compute IY. We know that it's a 10-year bond. We know that the present value is 510,000, so you put that in as a negative, hitting the plus minus number. It still pays $12,500, and the future value of the bond is 500,000. So if you compute IY, you should get 2.27, and that's the number that is built into this present value calculation to prove that the only way you arrive at 510,000 is with an interest rate or discount rate of 2.27. That results in a premium because this is $10,000 more than the face value of the bonds. The previous situation was sold at a discount because the present value was less than 500,000. And this would go through an amortization each year. And I've shown what the values of course would be. If we needed to know what the value of the bonds would be with five years left, it would be 505, 281. And then of course, to full maturity, $500,000. So now we can record the issue of the bonds on January 1st, 2020. 
using the residual approach. The journal entry basically is, on January 2nd, we're going to debit cash for 510,000. That's the amount of cash received for the issue of the bonds. The bond payable is actually the PV without the conversion option. If you're wondering how we arrived at that, you need to go back a couple of slides to the first amortization table to see where that is. And then what happens is the remainder is attributed to the contributed surplus for the conversion option. So debit cash, credit the bond payable, and credit the contributed surplus conversion option for 51583 And that's to record the issue of the convertible bonds at 102. Next, we will now look at requirement 1B, which is to record the bond conversion on June 30th, 2022. What we have to do here is debit interest expense for 473,537 times 3.5%. Now, if you're wondering what that is, from the amortization table, this is the value of the bonds just prior to the conversion because the first thing we have to do is update any interest prior to any conversion or sale. So that's what this journal entry is here. We're going to debit the interest expense for 16,568. We're going to credit cash for 12,500. And the difference is also a credit to the bond payable for 4,068. So the next step now is going to be to record the actual conversion of the bonds. We're going to debit the bond payable for 238712 That's calculated as 5N, 3.5 IY, 12,500 payment, and 500,000 future value, and times 50%, because we are converting 50% of the bonds. This is also the same thing as 50% of the value of the bonds uh, with 5N in the first amortization table or 477, 424 times 50%. Next is contributed surplus for the conversion option will be debited for half of the initial value set up, 51,583 times uh, 50%. So that will leave the remaining 50% will still be a credit balance in the contributed surplus conversion option account. And then finally, the sum of those two is our credit to common shares, 264,504. And if we want to know how many common shares were issued, if we take the 264,504 and divide it by the $25, this is the market price, as you're told in the data. 264,504 divided by a market price of $25 means that 10,580 common shares were issued as a result of this early conversion. And so that's the description of the journal entry. Record the early conversion of 50% of the convertible bonds and issue 10,580 common shares. Okay, our next requirement C is going to be to record the final bond conversion on December 31st, 2024. And we're going to reproduce the remaining a revised bond amortization table, the very first table that shows what the amortization of the remaining 50% of the bonds would be without the conversion feature. As I said before, if we take 5N, 3.5 IY, 12,500 payment, and 500,000 future value and take 50% of that, that means that the value of the unconverted bonds is 238,712, and that carries forward from the previous slide. And there are five periods left. So all this does is show us what the uh, annual interest expense is going to be and that at the end, we will reach a value of 250,000. So in order to journalize this, the first thing we have to do is update the interest. So what's happening here is this is recording the interest payment on the convertible bonds just before the conversion. The interest expense is 86.65. The cash that's paid is 62.50, and we know that is 12,500 times 50%. And the difference is going to be a credit to the bond payable account for this 24.15. So debit interest expense 86.65, credit bond payable 24.15, credit cash 62.50, and that brings it up to date. Now that we have brought the bonds up to date after the interest payment, we can now proceed with the final conversion of the bonds and the issue of how many shares result from that. So we know that the value in the bond payable account should be 250,000. So we're going to debit bonds payable for 250,000. We're going to 
debit the contributed surplus conversion option for the remaining 25,792, which is the other 50% of the original 51,583 attributed to the conversion option. So when we add those two, 250,000 plus 25,792, that gives us $275,792. And the market price at that point is $28, giving us 9,850 common shares issued. And we are finished accounting for this. Now that we're finished the first part, we're going to go on to requirement two of this problem. Requirement two basically will have us do all of the same things that we did in requirement one, except this time we're using the zero equity method as opposed to the residual method. So once again, we'll do the journal entries to issue the bonds on January 2nd, the early conversion of the bonds on June 30th, and the final conversion on December 31st, 2024. The main difference between the zero equity approach, which is applicable only for ASPE, remember that, is that we do not have to prepare any bond calculations without the conversion feature. So what we have here is we're going to show you a bond amortization table that's determined to be the present value with the conversion feature at 102. And guess what? This is exactly the same thing as we saw before. We have a $510,000 sales value because that's how much cash was received and that's what the bonds are worth. This amortization is exactly the same as before. And so is this uh, calculation that I have down at the bottom just to show. We need to calculate the effective rate, which is 2.27. Here it shows the, the full number of decimal places, so it's actually 2.27414. To record the issue of the bonds using the zero equity approach under ASPE, this is a really straightforward journal entry. We will, on January 2nd, 2020, debit cash for 510000 and credit bonds payable for 510000 That's it. It's a straightforward entry with no amount, so zero assigned to any conversion option. The next thing we're going to have to do here for the second requirement is record the bond conversion on June 30th, 2022. Of course, before the actual conversion, we have to do what we did last time and was record the interest on the bonds prior to conversion. So if you go and look at the amortization table on the previous slide, you'll see that at the period prior, at the end of the fourth payment, the balance in the bond account is $506,268. So we multiply that by 2.27% to give us the interest of 11513 which is in the fifth payment line. Cash will be credited for $12,500 and the bond payable debited, right, because we have a premium that's being amortized downwards, for $987. And so these items you'll see in the bond amortization table, those two numbers. Once we've brought the interest to date, of course, now we can record the conversion. We will debit the bond payable and credit the common shares. The bond payable, we will take 50% of the value in the bond account after the interest payment, or 5N, 2.2714IY, 12,500 payment, 500,000 future value, and take 50% of that, which is the same thing as 505280 times 50%. Debit the bonds, credit the common shares, and if we want to know how many shares are issued as a result of that, of course, we divide by the $25 market price, and that's what we have. So early conversion, 50% of the convertible bonds issuing 10,106 common shares. Now we can proceed with the final conversion. What we need to do is show the final years left. So you see after the conversion, we have 252,640 left to amortize over five periods. So this is the revised amortization table. A couple ways you could do that to, to determine that number as we did before. We took the full numbers or full amounts of the payment and the future value and multiplied by 50%. Or of course, since we only are left with 50%, of the original $500,000 bonds, we can go and update the future value to $250,000 and then take a payment of $62,50, which is 50% of each of those anyway. So there's a few ways that you can go about that. Then to record the journal entry of the final conversion at December 31st, 2024, we're going to debit the bond interest expense for $5,698, credit cash, for that payment amount of $62.50 and debit the bond payable account for $552 for the last amortization of the premium. And of course, this again brings our interest up to date prior to the conversion.
The last piece, after we've updated the interest, is now to record the final conversion. So the bond payable has a balance of 250000 We're going to debit the bond payable for 250000 Remember that with the zero equity approach, there actually is no amount that it was attributed to the conversion option. So there's no conversion option to be adjusted. So the full amount will go to the common shares, 250000 and that results in an issue of 8,929 shares based on a market price of $28. So record the remaining 50% conversion and issue 8,929 common shares. And we are now finished accounting for this under the zero equity approach. Now we can wrap up with some key points to remember. First, convertible bonds must be accounted for using the residual method under IFRS. ASPE does allow for the option of using the residual method or the zero equity approach. What we did in the first part would be applicable to both IFRS and ASPE, and then the second requirement was applicable only to ASPE. Next, under the residual method, the difference between the present value of the bonds with the conversion option and without the conversion option is the amount that's allocated to the contributed surplus conversion option account. All right, so we need to calculate both of those, the present value of the bonds without the conversion option, the present value of the bonds with the conversion option, which is usually told to you because that's the amount that the bonds sell for. Any amortization of any premium or discount under that approach is based on the effective interest rate approach and used to determine the present value of the bond without the conversion option. Next, under the zero equity method, no amount is allocated to contributed surplus, as we saw. The amortization of any discounted premium is based on the effective interest rate and used to determine the PV of the bond with the conversion option. So that was the same under both. And with anything prior to any conversions, ensure that the carrying value of the bonds is updated using the appropriate effective interest rate. So that's what we were illustrating is just before the conversion is to do that last interest payment entry. Next, IFRS requires the effective interest rate method to amortize bond discounts and premiums. Now, ASPE does allow for the choice between using the effective rate and straight line methods to amortize discounts or premiums. We illustrated this example using the effective interest rate. That's the, the approach that you can expect to have to use because it's just the more complicated of the two, and it's actually the preferred approach. This concludes tutorial 8A on accounting for convertible bonds uh, without any incentives. You can now refer to tutorial 8B to review accounting for convertible bonds with an incentive, so it's a little bit more complicated.